Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Standard. I'm the founder and CEO of Petabridge, and today I'm gonna to talk about an important architectural concept known as back pressure. If you're building asynchronous software, this is going to affect you. So it's important, let's go ahead and address it and talk about what we can do about back pressure inside our applications. So to start off, I wanted to use an example of this Stack Overflow question I addressed earlier this week. Uh, this user is using one of our open source components, aukastreams.kafka, to build a fairly simple streaming application. So they're consuming events from Kafka, and each one of those events is going to get fed into this run for each method right here, where they're telling that message to a single actor. And according to the user, this is generating a large amount of CPU utilization. Well, I can immediately spot what the problem is here, and that's that the actorref.tell method is asynchronous and non-blocking. As a result of that, we're going to consume events from Kafka as fast as the Kafka client can possibly push them into our stream. And that's going to drive up a large amount of CPU utilization inside the system. There's gonna be lots of events all in flight, all getting processed all at once. And if there's no back pressure support built into this application, high CPU or high memory utilization or high IO is going to be the natural consequence of that. This isn't an Akka.net specific problem. This is an asynchronous producer consumer pattern problem. Let's go ahead and take the example of a public web API. And let's say it's subject to a large amount of traffic and some of that traffic gets diverted to an internal application that performs some bespoke business domain specific code here. And let's say that internal application is receiving roughly 10,000 requests per second. Well, imagine for a moment, this internal application talks to a SQL database or maybe a NoSQL database like Mongo. And due to the way those queries are designed, maybe they're complex and touch a lot of tables. Uh, maybe they perform some scans. Maybe they use synthetic tables. Whatever the reasoning might be, let's say those queries can perform on the hardware that this particular company is using right now, a theoretical maxima of 1,000 requests per second. This is going to result in the system tipping over and failing as a result. You're going to see very high contention on the task queue, or in the case of a relational database, it might be table queue contention or table lock contention. You might see memory utilization run away, or you might see frequent timeouts occur as a result of this. And this is a problem that affects the vast majority of asynchronous producer-consumer systems. When traffic is low, let's say traffic's below 1,000 requests per second, this problem doesn't really need to be addressed because uh, it's never really going to come up. But once the producer starts producing traffic, even in small bursts that are beyond what the consumers can handle, you're going to begin having back pressure problems inside your application, which is exactly what the end user in our Stack Overflow question was running into. So let's take a look at the source code that user was using, or really something that's quite similar to that, and understand where the back pressure is coming from. So this is some Akka.net syntax on the left that uses AkkaStreams.Kafka and uses a, a very similar messaging pattern to what that user in Stack Overflow was using, which is we have a plain Kafka consumer, which is going to consume all the events uh, beginning from the beginning of a partition. And for my little demo app I built here, I've got, I think, 3 million events sitting inside, well, 1 million events sitting in three different partitions for the same topic. So we're gonna to expect to process uh, at least one partition's worth of events with one consumer. We're gonna go ahead and just tell a copy of this message to an actor, and it's non-blocking. Tell is asynchronous, but it doesn't return a task. It's just a void method, so there's nothing for us to A wait on. Therefore, when we fire off this message, it's gonna get processed, and it's gonna happen asynchronously in the background somewhere. Well, let's see what my app actor does. That's the type of actor we're sending this message to, and you can see that declared up on this line here. Well, our app actor is going to spin up a brand new unit of work actor, this little longer actor right here. So for every single message that we receive, we're going to begin a brand new actor and we're going to forward the message to it. This actor is going to use a little bit of async await just to kind of simulate some, let's say, network IO inside the system. And this is going to uh, basically cause us to see a fairly significant spike in memory utilization inside this application. Uh, the reason being is that this actor is going to stay alive for however long this task.delay is going to be, between 1 to 15 seconds. Then after that uh, task completes, we'll go ahead and log a message and shut the actor down. Because the app actor sitting above the logger actor is basically running you know, asynchronously, it's going to spin up as many of these child actors as it possibly can. And there's going to be nothing that signals to Kafka 
that the system is having trouble keeping up with it. Therefore, it's just going to keep pumping actors again and again and again into this application. And so here's sort of what the workflow kind of looks like. Uh, we have our Kafka consumer right here. Our will run for each statement, which is going to cause us to message our app actor. And then we're going to spin up possibly thousands of these logger actors in parallel. Kind of depends on how quickly we can possibly get events out of the Kafka consumer down here. I'm going to go ahead and press pause for a second here and actually get my demo application up and running just so we can see what the memory and performance characteristics look like for this application. And we're going to compare that to an application that actually does have proper back pressure support built into it in a moment. All right, so this is my little Kafka consumer application. It looks just like it did on the slides. Uh, we're going to go ahead and configure the app to start at the earliest offset. So we're going to start at the very beginning of the partition. There should be roughly a million events inside of it. We're not going to process all of them, but just wanted to make sure I had enough uh, to run the demo. And here we're just going to send a message to an actor. Uh, this little uh, app actor here is going to spin up children. And these children are going to block on this little fake IO task we created with task.delay here. Then they're going to log a message to the console and shut themselves down. What we should notice here is that there's going to be a lot of these logger actors running in parallel at any given time. And you're going to see big spikes in memory utilization as groups of actors shut down and, stop and uh, also start up together, depending on what this randomly assigned uh, delay is going to be. So we're going to see that show up fairly consistently inside the application here. Let me go ahead and launch it from the console and we'll keep track of the memory utilization and task manager here. So let me go to the console. I'm going to do .NET run. And this should spin up in just a moment. Okie dokie. There we go. Looks like we're actually getting some events out of Kafka now. That's great. And what does our data look like? Looks like we are in terms of our total memory utilization, hanging out around about 70 megs right now. And oh, there we go, closer to about 100 megabytes and about 5% CPU utilization. And based on my experience last time I ran this application, this is roughly where the utilization is gonna stay. It's kind of in this five to 6% uh, CPU utilization and about 100 megs of RAM. This is a fairly lightweight application, even though we have no back pressure support built into it at all. We're not gonna overwhelm the CPUs on my fairly powerful development machine right here. It's just not gonna happen. Uh, but if our actors were doing something more expensive, such as maybe issuing queries to the database, talking to web APIs, performing serialization or disk IO, or maybe doing something a little bit more computationally expensive, like computing you know, GIS coordinates or something like that, you would see much larger amounts of both CPU, memory, and IO utilization occurring here. And that's really kind of the problem, is that this application has no way of regulating itself once it starts pulling events from Kafka, it's going to keep going as fast as it can pull events out of it. So either we're going to hit the end of the partition and there's going to be uh, no more events, in which case there's no problem, or we're going to see the application eventually tip over and fail, or we're going to see it become slightly unavailable as a result of being too busy to respond. So there's all sorts of different issues that lack of back pressure support causes higher resource utilization, and then eventually lack of availability are the two big ones we want to deal with. So let's go ahead and talk about some techniques for how to actually introduce back pressure support into our applications. So what back pressure support is ultimately about inside an asynchronous application is the consumer needs some way of signaling to the producer that I need you to slow down. I have as many events as I can handle right now. I need you to go ahead and either pause production or at least slow it down until I'm ready to consume more. So that's the ultimate thing we need to do is we need to try to force the producer to wait until the downstream is ready. If SQL Server is overwhelmed and requests are timing out, there's no benefit in continuing to hammer it by pulling more events from Kafka. Therefore, it'd be better if we go ahead and told Kafka, you know what, we're gonna go ahead and pause reading this partition right now until we know that we've processed the backlog of everything that needs to be saved to SQL Server. Once that backlog is clear, then we'll go ahead and begin reading from Kafka again. This kind of gives you a little bit of vertical load balancing is kind of the right way to think about it, where the bottom consumer of your application, which is kind of the, going to be the, you know, the point of bottleneck in your system, is able to tell the faster running producer, I need you to adjust until I'm ready. So this is the best practice, and this is ultimately the best way to implement back pressure support. 
Now that's not always gonna be possible. Good example, our web API from earlier, we don't really have the ability to tell clients who are trying to hit our HTTP endpoints that we need them to stop sending us requests for the time being. That's the same as being unavailable. So we have to be a little bit more creative in those scenarios. And one of the techniques we can use there, which we're not gonna show in this presentation, but if you're interested in learning how to do this type of thing, I recommend watching our Introduction to Aka Streams video. This has a whole bunch of different tools on how to implement disintermediation. So some examples of this include things like buffering or queuing messages until they can be processed. So this is deferring execution until we're ready. Um, if you have a finite buffer size, which if you're running inside a single process, you will, uh, you might need to configure this to drop older or newer messages when the buffer size hits capacity. And that might force the clients to have to resubmit their requests at some point in the future. So you're te temporarily unavailable when this happens. Uh, if you're using a cloud service, like let's say a hosted Kafka instance or Azure service bus, uh, then you're probably not going to hit a fixed, a fixed limit. You're just going to go ahead and keep queuing events up inside your system and they're just going to bill you more for it. So that's kind of one of the advantages of having a, a cloud hosted system for queuing up messages that can't be processed right now. Um, the other thing we can do is try batching messages together into larger units of work. If it's possible to kind of aggregate units of work together into one single bigger execution unit, then that's something we can do to help disintermediate processing as well. Uh, the other things we can do are pre-aggregate messages prior to processing. This is what systems like OpenTelemetry do with metrics data, for instance. Rather than sending a fire hose with millions of metric updates, they all get pre-aggregated together into larger deltas and sent as a smaller number of events. That way, there's less traffic going over the wire, less congestion, and ultimately, it's going to help the system stay more available when we do that. And another technique we can use is debouncing. Uh, this is essentially where you detect many messages that have either similar or identical content and you flatten it. You basically say, nah, instead of having 30 events for this, we're just gonna con consolidate it down to a single event. Uh, debouncing comes up a lot in like user, you know, user interface driven applications where you might get a ton of events from the mouse when someone's dragging their cursor over the screen. Rather than processing thousands of events from the mouse, you might say, you know what? I just need to know what its position was 30 milliseconds ago versus where it is now. And I can automatically perform a translation when that happens. That's an example of debouncing, for instance. How would we go about adding back pressure support to this little Kafka application we've been looking at? Well, the answer might actually be simpler than you think. So we're using Aka streams to drive all the you know, event-driven behavior in the system. And I've added a new stage to the middle of our Aka streams graph right here. Select async unordered. This allows me to specify a maximum degree of parallelism. So I'm saying 100 uh, concurrent tasks can run at any given time. And I have a little function here that performs an async await. And essentially it's gonna say there can be up to 100 of these running at any given time. As soon as the 101st instance of this task tries to run, we're going to back pressure our Kafka consumer and cause it to stop reading from the partition for the time being until at least one of these tasks completes down below here. This is going to give us the ability to regulate the amount of memory and CPU our application uses. And this will be quite visible on our graph once we start um, actually running the application locally. So from an actor standpoint, the one thing we need to do to support this is I have this little line here, sender.tell complete. Rather than doing just fire and forget messaging like it was before with actorref.tell, now we're doing actorref.ask. This is request response messaging. Why I'm saying that this actor actually needs to receive a reply back of type string before this task can complete. I'm sending that string back after we've completed processing. So I know that all my work is done. I'm about to shut myself down. I'm basically freeing up my unit of work that was reserved for me to another actor who can step in and take my place. So we need to send this explicit acknowledgement back to the sender in order to acknowledge that we have completed processing. What we've basically done here is built essentially a token bucket throttling system where every single request is one token. We take one out in order to process it and we put the token back when we're done. That's what's been occurring here. If the task errors, by the way, if the actor, let's say, crashes or whatever, uh, that's gonna also result in that token basically being restored. Although technically I need to add some error handling to make sure that happens as smoothly, which I haven't done in this example, but you get the idea. All right, so I've actually changed branches to my back pressure branch for being able to uh, actually introduce this back pressure support we saw in my PowerPoint slides. So if I scroll down here, you can see my little, you know, slight async unordered statement right here. 
Uh, this is going to be how we introduce back pressure to our application. Now, if you recall from our previous implementation, which was not back pressured at all, we were doing between five to 6% CPU utilization and roughly 100 megs of memory consumption. Let's see what it looks like when I launch it with back pressure support enabled. Oops, that was the wrong command. Let me cancel that. Should be .NET run release. Type that in. Okie dokie. And I've already compiled this, so this should just kick off right away. Okay, there we go. We can see some responses coming in now. And let's take a look at what our data looks like. So we are running at roughly 0.6% CPU utilization and about 36 megs of RAM. So roughly one third of the memory consumption and about, let's say, one tenth of the CPU utilization as well. So this application is going to also noticeably run at a slower rate in addition to uh, using fewer resources. We're not gonna be processing as many requests in flight as we normally would inside our application. That's one of the trade-offs we're making here. So this back pressure support is kind of intentionally throttling uh, the Kafka consumer, the rate at which we can go ahead and pull those events from Kafka. What's nice about this design though, is that I can actually tune the degree of parallelism by just changing this one variable right here. If I notice that my application is running with plenty of headroom to spare, and I wanna go ahead and increase the number of concurrent instances of my actors that are running in parallel, I can just increase this value. And so the back pressure support will scale linearly with this. So if I go from, let's say, you know, 100 units of parallelism to 1,000, I'll get that many more concurrent tasks and actors. So that's what's kind of really nice about this back pressure support right here. Obviously, this is a little bit of a uh, contrived example. In a real world system, I might be connecting this Kafka plane source to let's say a SQL Server sync, and SQL Server will start back pressuring once its requests start taking longer than a certain period of time. So if we start noticing that our, let's say, insert operations to SQL Server are taking longer than let's say a couple of milliseconds or maybe tens of milliseconds, uh, that'll start to slow down the rate at which we pull events from Kafka as well. So this is where back pressure support kind of really gives us some material tangible benefits. It's able to help us um, control the degree of resource consumption inside our application, and it also helps us guarantee availability. The next thing we should take a look at is what does my actual flow of execution look like now that I've introduced these changes? So let's hop back into PowerPoint to check that out. All right, so I'm back in PowerPoint here, and this is what our graph now looks like. We have this additional select async stage sitting in the middle here, and this has a finite amount of capacity, N. Well, when we hit that capacity, What's gonna end up happening is that the Kafka consumer is going to have a little dead man switch built into it. It's gonna notice that this stage in Aka Streams is no longer demanding additional events. So it's gonna pause reading from Kafka for the time being, meaning that we're gonna go ahead and tell the Kafka consumer to stop polling for events on this particular topic for the time being. Now, if some of these requests actually begin to succeed again, let's say at least one of these tasks completes, that's gonna go ahead and restore some capacity back inside this stage. And as a result, we're gonna start requesting data from Kafka again. And when that happens, Kafka is gonna say, okay, I've got this much demand available from downstream. I'm gonna consume that many events. That might be one event, might be 10, might be 100. Kind of depends on how quickly these tasks complete at any given time. And as a result of that, we're gonna go ahead and pull more events out of Kafka, push them back into the stage, deliver those messages to the app actor and kick off more of these tasks. So as a result of this, we now have feedback going from the bottom of our application, these logger actors, all the way back to the top, our Kafka consumer. This is going to be what allows our application to regulate itself in terms of its resource consumption, the amount of parallelism, and also it's gonna help us protect the sort of bottlenecky parts of our system, such as a database or maybe a shared file system of some type. And this is really what that user and that Stack Overflow question needs to implement. This was in the answer that I gave them, which is you need to have some feedback loop from your actors indicating that they have work, they're still in the middle of processing and they're not ready for more demand right now. That's really the right way to fix these types of back pressure problems. In theory, you could also add some additional Aka stream stages, like a throttle stage, for instance. And if you're interested in learning more about that, check out my link to that video at the end of this one. So thank you very much. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and let us know if you have any questions in the comments.